Dr. Palmieri. Okay, well, today's about change. As you all know, whenever I give a talk, it's not just about burns. There's always things in, there's kernels in it that you can carry out through your practice. So, you know, some of, some of you guys are not over 50. So some of this stuff has happened in your lifetime. For those over 50, life is just beginning. Okay, so today we're going to talk about some of the changes that have happened in the last 50 years. We're going to talk about acute treatment strategies, some of the challenges that happen in the long-term care of burn patients. Is it about survival or is it about living? Talk about some partnership and identify some goals for the future. So no disclosures, no financial, other than this was Arnold, really. Okay, when I was your age, this is what Arnold looked like. Okay, <laughs> he looked pretty good back then. Um, and <laughs> some things happened, you know. So what has happened in those 50 years? <laughs> What has happened? The World Wide Web. The inventor of the World Wide Web actually lives in the UK. Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, was in, in England, in, in London, and he was the person who actually invented the World Wide Web notice in 1989. How many people here were born after 1989? Uh-huh, see? We call you the young guys and gals. The mobile phone. Okay, imagine your attendings carrying this. Okay. When I was a resident, I, had, I carried a roll of quarters in my pocket because I had to know where the nearest pay phone was because there was no phone. There's no cell phone. Think about how complicated life was. I mean, those, they made a lot of money off of us. Security in airports. Now we expect to be stopped at an airport and put our bags on a belt. Whereas 50 years ago, you could just waltz in 10 minutes before your flight and get on the plane. No issue. And terrorism has become a concern. It used to be something that happened to those people in that place at that time. And now it's, it's, it hits home. It hits here. In almost every part of the world, terrorism has become a way of life. It's something that we all have to think about. Medically, some of the biggest advances have occurred in intensive care, not necessarily in the surgical field, but in anesthesia. The laryngeal, laryngeal mask airway. Again, it's very commonplace for us to see an LMA in now. 30 years ago, when that was first introduced, it was considered heresy by most of us. It's like, oh my God, that's not really an airway. And propofol came into practice about 20 years ago. And again, for those of us attendings old enough, to, I still remember the first patient I saw propofol going in their veins, and nobody warned me that this was the new agent in town. I almost had a heart attack right there. I'm like, oh my God, that's milk going to my patient. Okay, never seen it before, but yes, propofol came on. And burn outcomes have changed. Not all that stuff and also burn outcomes. Burns, it's the devastating injury that nobody wants. I get told a lot, you know, you're a great doctor, but I really don't want to have you as a doctor because they don't want to be burned. And there's a good reason. In the 1950s, look at mortality. The LD50 for someone age 65 was 10% body surface area in the 1950s. And you had a 50-50 chance of dying with a 44% burn if you were 20 years old in 1950. Today, the LD50 for all burns is right about 70%. And if you're a child between the ages of 5 and 15, that LD50 goes up to almost 95% in certain centers. Big changes in mortality. How did we do that? That all happened in 50 years, basically. What happened? First thing was we defined priorities of care. Survival, function, aesthetics, socialization. Survival had to be number one. In 1950, with those tight size burns dying, survival had to be the priority. So the first focus was on priority, was on survival. Even the best operation is a failure if our patient dies afterwards, right? You could do a beautiful anastomosis, the best ever, but if they die, it kind of is a meaningless exercise. So the areas that were improved the most, actually, in those first few years were inhalation, injury, resuscitation, and wound management. We'll talk a little bit about this. 
In, 19, in the late 1980s, the uh, mortality from isolated inhalation injury was 56%. That went down in 2006 to about 12%, and today it's about 7%. So inhalation injury dropped markedly. Why is that? Are burn doctors just like really smart lung doctors? Did we throw everything into lungs? No. We stole it. The, our, this trial, if, especially this part of the year, it's very, uh, and this is one of the landmark trials that's cited on the bottom of this slide that everyone should read. This is the trial that changed how we ventilate patients with severe lung disease. And in Burns, we took this to heart. Basically what happened is that people looked at were we causing damage and trying to support people's lungs ventilatorily with a ventilator. And we determined that if you had high peak airway pressures with high tidal volumes, you actually were damaging the lungs and trying to protect them. And this article delineated a conservative strategy to ventilate patients to decrease barotrauma and improve mortality. And here is the mortality improvement. This changed ventilation parameters internationally. And this is how we ventilate pa patients with severe ARDS now. These are the setting, the general settings that are the goal. And what this did was it brought down the peak airway pressures and there were no longer the new iatrogenic pneumothoraces from mechanical ventilation. There was no longer the airway trauma from mechanical ventilation. Now, of course, we in Burns, we had to take it one step farther because we can't just do it. We got our own little ventilator. Now, Forrest Bird was the inventor of most ventilators, and he, he died about a year and a half ago. And his wife had alpha-2 antitrypsin deficiency, his fourth wife. He's had, he had about five or six in his lifetime. Um, and he really liked her, and he wanted her to live longer. <laughs> well, it's a good thing to like your wife. Um, and he actually invented a ventilator and a type of ventilation that, just for her. Alpha-2 antitrypsin deficiency causes buildup of pulmonary secretions. Um, the cilia do not work properly. And so he built a specific ventilator, which is uh, IPV, basically what we use uh, for our IPV and our patients in the ICU, to help her clear secretions. And he made it into this ventilator that you see here. Now, you notice it doesn't look like any conventional ventilator you've ever seen. It's basically a pressure-controlled time cycle ventilator that incorporates jet ventilation with pressure ventilation. So you get the advantages of a, of a conventional ventilator over, with, with a jet ventilator overlaid. So you can oxygenate using the jet uh, ventilation and ventilate using the, the, other, um, the pressure ventilation. And you notice that it's not as fast as an oscillator. 250, you can take it up to 1,700 breaths per minute on the oscillatory rate. But um, it actually has great advantages. And in, this was actually trialed in burns uh, in inhalation injury. And guess what? There's a lot less barotrauma. You could ventilate a patient with a third as much pressure as what they were using on conventional mechanical ventilation at the time. Big drops in pressure and decreases in mortality and pneumonia in children. This is a great ventilator for young children. The problem is that Dr. Bird's this really smart guy and he couldn't just use standard ventilator terms. Everything got renamed. So you got this thing called a phasotron and a variable rate and a fixed, and so you had to learn a whole language to use this ventilator. That's, that's the downside of the VDR. Um, and he used to have people go up to his ranch just to learn how to put the ventilator together and learn the terminology. Uh, and I still remember doing that way back when. Um, but it is something that requires specialized care and hands-on respiratory therapists, which is why you don't see it here. If your respiratory therapists are split in several units, it's not, this ventilator has, needs to be watched over. So that's why you see it when you're at Shriners and you won't see it as much here. So what do we learn from respiratory? More is not always better, okay? More volume is not better. We can learn from other disciplines, and we should learn from other disciplines. The pulmonologists hit on something with a low tidal volume ventilation. 
We shouldn't be afraid, afraid to try new technologies, and we still don't know a lot about inhalation injury. There's still room. 7% mortality is still way higher than our, than our colleagues doing cardiac, cardiac bypass surgery, right? We got to get down there. We got to make you guys have a higher mortality than we do. That's our goal. Improvement two, resuscitation. Remember, in the 1930 period, hypovolemic shock was actually the lead, one of the leading causes of death and burns uh, in that time. Then multiple formulas got created, and then hypovolemia and renal failure decreased, and so did mortality. And we're like, yeah, success, right? Yeah, maybe. How many formulas are there for burn resuscitation? If you look it up, you're going to find about 25. And if you ask 10 burn surgeons, you'll get 10 different resuscitation formulas. Nobody does it exactly the same. So if one formula works, why isn't everybody using it? Because it doesn't work in everybody. Everybody has their own way. It's like following your own roadmap. The other factor is that the patients didn't read the book and they don't know that they're supposed to follow the formula. They just do, their physiology is their physiology and we have to adjust to it. So the fluid requirements are very variable. And these are some of the things that alter the accuracy of every formula. Inhalation injury actually will increase the resuscitation about 30%. Think of it as a wound, you, weeping fluid that you can't see. Okay, you can see it on the skin, but you can't see it in the bronchus. Age, you know, a little old 90-year-old lady who drinks half a cup of tea a day is always dehydrated. When she gets burned, she's going to be very dehydrated, and that's going to be a problem. Delays in resuscitation, that guy who was, you know, drunk and fell in the fire and kind of rolled out of it and rolled himself off and couldn't quite manage to get to the emergency room for about eight or nine hours, he's going to need a massive resuscitation because he's so dehydrated. When an escrotomy or fasciotomy is performed, you just open the dam. The skin was acting as a barrier for that fluid to escape. Electrical burns, electrical burns are the uh, iceberg. You can't see the extent of injury, so you don't know how much fluid they're losing. And alcohol and drugs, no patient ever admitted to UC Davis has alcohol and drugs, right? Right. Well, in, in the burn unit, it's about 30% and getting higher. We, we uh, just had our 80-year-old our gentleman with uh, <coughs> smoking marijuana every day. He's having a good time. So why isn't resuscitation done right all the time? You have to measure a patient weight, the burn size, the burn depth, and urine output. This sounds really easy, but think about it. How many times have you seen a patient get weighed in the resuscitation bay? Does anyone ever seen, I've never seen a scale in the recess room. Is there one? Yes. It's on the bed. Okay, I've never seen it work, um, but I've never seen anybody weighed. And then, you know, fluid creep happened. This was coined by Dr. Pruitt, who is the originator of most great sayings and burns. They, they originate with him. He's an incredible individual. People started having fluid overload. Too much fluid was being administered to people. It led to compartment syndrome, blindness from elevations and intraocular pressure, pulmonary edema, and massive edema. Why did fluid creep become a problem? And everyone knows I love this analogy. So you have a piece of chocolate cake. It tastes pretty good, right? Pick your favorite food. Okay. Chocolate cake. First piece is really good. You're like, hmm, I really like that piece of chocolate cake. I'll have another one. I'll feel even better after the second one. Okay, you managed to down the second chocolate cake, okay? You're starting to feel a little queasy by this time. Either that or you're starting to ping off the walls because you've got a little sugar. And by now you're so energized, i got to eat another piece because like I'm getting jittery because maybe that'll make me stop jittering. So I eat a third piece, and what happens? You are sicker than a dog. And that is because there is such a thing as overdoing a good thing. And that's what fluid creep is. We think that a little fluid is good, and so we're reluctant to take it back down and decrease it when the patient has the response because we like that good feeling. We've gotten there. If we give them a little more, they'll be even better and it doesn't always work that way. Other reasons is people don't understand the formula. I've had someone give a 24-hour resuscitation in two hours because they misunderstood that the Parkland formula was meant to be split over 24 hours, not two. 
Um, people don't follow the formula. They look at a high hemoglobin and say, oh, I have to give them more. Not always true. They forget or you can't measure urine output. You can't measure urine output in a helicopter in most cases because the Foley bag is usually sitting on the patient and it doesn't dependently drain. So asking someone in a helicopter to monitor urine output is, can be very problematic. Using the actual body weight in an obese person, I mean, we never see obesity here, right? Obesity doesn't increase your renal function magically. You can't imagine that, that person who's, you know, 30 plus BMI, they still have the inner body and the inner mechanisms of someone who's much smaller. So they don't need to make, a 100 kilo person doesn't need to make 100 kilos of, 100 milliliters of urine an hour. It's what their ideal body weight would be. And is urine output even a good marker of resuscitation? Just hold the baits on that score. So what do we learn from resuscitation? More is not better. Uh, it seems like a recurrent theme. The patient should guide their treatment. Okay, every resuscitation should be personalized medicine. Things we can't control will impact what we do. We can't control that that person took drugs or that that person has some comorbidity. Human nature will also trump every protocol that you can ever write. And if your protocol goes against what people do as, as part of their culture, you're not going to change it by just saying, I'm going to do a protocol. And we have a long way to go. There's work going on now with computer resuscitation, closed loop resuscitation that takes the human being out of resuscitation, alters the IV fluid rate based on the urine output. Need better markers for resuscitation? Look at colloids, and the holy grail is a perfect formula, which is going to be a non-formula. So wound management, isn't that what we do in burns? Those who've been on the service know we do a lot more than wounds, but this is, this is one of my favorite stories. Is that in early burns, it used to be wait and see. Well, you know, I'm not sure. We'll wait until it gets as small as it can be, and then we're going to excise it real quick and put a graft on. And that was done because they didn't have blood products and they didn't have anything to put on it. And for a long time, burn surgery was excluded from surgical management of injuries. In fact, the burn unit... People would look at what, which direction the prevailing wind was going and put the burn unit downwind, okay, so that the wind would blow the smell away from the hospital. And that's what burn units were. Why? Because the dressing changes went on forever and things started to smell bad. And this resulted in sepsis, long hospital stays, joint contractures, hypertrophic scars, and people were dying literally from sepsis, because they kept getting these infection bouts. And the disease, it looked bad, it smelled bad, patients suffered and patients were deformed. <coughs> Think about every movie you've seen with a burned person in it. Has any burned person ever been the good guy? <laughs> Think about it. And the scarring. Think about the stigma that exists in that. It's true. This is my hero. Zora Yankovic, she uh, was an incredible woman. Her story is that she was actually assigned to Maribor, and for, for those who don't know, it's right next to Austria um, after, in the night, late 50s after World War II. And she was assigned to the burn ward. Now, the only problem with that was she wasn't a trained burn surgeon. She wasn't a trained surgeon. She was a trained doctor. Uh, she wasn't a dermatologist. And she and a group of women were said, here, take care of these burn patients. There was no ward, there was nothing. So there was global poverty, there was plenty of poverty and plenty of patients. So she took over a dermatology ward, she cleaned it up, she got equipment from the junkyard and revamped it to become medical equipment that she could use and started doing the latest burn care, which was basically pick at the wounds until they got small enough and then try a small graft. And she said, you know, this is not working. This is just not working. So she said, okay, I'm gonna get my own operating room. I'm not a plastic surgeon, but I'm not a trained surgeon, but I'm gonna get my own operating room and I'm gonna figure this out. And her key question, simple question from someone who was not embedded in the, in the burn care at the, of the time, was she's asked herself, why are we waiting? I mean, this is like crazy. We're waiting for this to separate and people are dying while we're waiting. So she began excising it. She's like, okay, I'm gonna cut it off. And she picked wounds 
that were small but clearly full thickness burns that she knew would not going to heal and it was just a matter of how much they would have to graft and she started doing it and she developed the concept of octal excision time bleeding is a sign of tissue viability and then co immediate coverage with a skin graft either aloe or autograft and she did it and no one believed her the burn surgeons of the time did not believe her so she actually presented at several conferences and showed videos of her work and videos of the outcome and they still didn't believe her but people started visiting her and she just had an open door policy and 250 surgeons over the next 10 years came to her shop watched her operate watched her outcomes and slowly it was when dr jackson came and said oh this is real he was one of the big names in burns that it started moving forward but she is the person who created early burn excision and she actually single-handedly changed the face of burn surgery. And as a result, burn survival improved. In adults, there's a randomized uh, trial, and in children, the same thing. Decreased mortality, improved outcomes. And why? Less infection. This is, not, this is something that's very intuitive to us today. What's less intuitive is that by excising the burn, you actually stem the cytokine response to acute injury and you improve cardiac function. This elegant work from Maria Horton, Horton demonstrated that cardiac function improves due to reduction of the pro-inflammatory cytokines after early excision. So early excision kind of stems the inflammatory process and it helps cardiac function by reducing the cytokines. And in children, it even helps to attenuate muscle catabolism and as well as all the sepsis issues, but it does not change their energy expenditure. So an energy expenditure in a burn patient is approximately twice normal in someone with a burn of 40% or more. In terms of outcomes, hospitalization is shortened, physician costs are, short, are, are decreased, and the number, amount of time off work is decreased. And there's even less scarring. So by waiting, on a wound, you actually increase the scarring even after you graft it. So early excision became the standard and was one of the big leaps forward in terms of survival and burns. What do we learn from all this? Doing nothing can cause harm. Asking why you do something may lead to big changes in treatment. And that's why it's so important to listen to every member of the team because it's that person who may not be embedded in what you do that may ask the key question that changes things. We always have to keep our ears open for that. We need to evaluate our outcomes and we still have a long way to go. There's still a lot of scarring and burns and there still ain't a good guy with a burn scar in a big movie. Okay, we're gonna work on that. All right, number four, the hypermetabolic response. Wouldn't we all like to be like treading on that treadmill? The hypermetabolic response is multifactorial, and addressing it has to be multifactorial, including pain control, agents, and an exercise program. So we talked about that the burn, the burns is a great weight loss program. Okay, not only do you lose, your skin's only eight pounds, so it's not your skin, okay? The reason why you lose weight after burns is that you have a hypermetabolic response. Um, you get, a tachycardia, your thermostat is reset. So now your normal temperature is 38.5. All the folks who've been on the burn service know that we don't even, we're happy at 38.5. When we hit 39.5, that's, we, we, that's our threshold for obtaining a blood culture. Otherwise we'd be culturing everybody about five times a day. Um, and it goes from months after injury. You lose lean muscle mass, strength, and weight. And if you ameliorate, you can improve outcomes. Early excision and grafting helps. Aggressive enteral nutrition, early mobility, some pharmacologic agents is what we're gonna concentrate on for today. Also increasing the ambient atmosphere. You guys wonder why the burn room is 95 degrees. It's not that we just wanna see a sweat and like cull the weak from the flock. Anyone who hits the ground is not destined for greatness, no. Um, it's because, number one, our patients get cold, but when, they, when patients shiver, they actually expend huge amounts of energy to shiver. It's very energy consuming. So that's why shivering is, even post-operatively, there's shiver order sets um, because of the energy expenditure that can actually cause impairment in all kinds of, of systems. So we concentrate on, can we make them stronger? Okay, this is why, why uh, 
our governor, our ex-governor, Mr. Schwarzenegger, comes in handy because he used a few things. Okay, so human growth hormone has been used in children and this wonderfully constructed slide that went, morphed on its own um, shows that in children with major burns, growth hormone can actually be an anabolic and increased protein synthesis in, in children with large burns. The problem with growth hormone is that there's virilization that occurs with it. So people started using oxandrolone, which is uh, an analog of testosterone, and it's used in several disease states, including AIDS, myopathy, hepatic failure, and, uh, and incapacitating COPD. It improves nitrogen balance and decreases weight loss. So it's overall a pretty well stru uh, struck drug. It's inexpensive, it can be given orally, and it's less virilization, as I said. And in burns, uh, we were part of this randomized prospective multicenter trial that evaluated oxandrolone in burn patients and found a reduction in mortality and length of stay as a result. So oxandrolone, as you can see, everybody on our service with a burn over 20% gets 10 milligrams twice a day based on this trial. Other studies, there have been some retrospective studies, and the latest thing that Dr. Herndon is, is evaluating is the combination of oxandrolone and propranolone. <laughs> So you'll be seeing that in the literature. Insulin is another anabolic agent that we all use that actually has incredible anti-inflammatory and healing properties, and it also helps to reduce the hypermetabolic response. This is a sleeper that, unless you know insulin well, you don't know this. It mediates peripheral glucose uptake into skeletal muscle and adipose tissues, uh, it controls amino acids, it decreases proteinolysis, so in other words, you retain your protein. And the result is you get increased DNA replication protein synthesis. So protein gets generated, not destroyed. This is really important in terms of wound healing. It's also anti-inflammatory, and lots of basic science stuff here. It does reduce reactive oxygen species generation, and it ultimately decreases the pro-inflammatory cascade and increases the anti-inflammatory cascade. So it settles down inflammation. It's a very complex drug with complex actions. In burns, stress-induced hyperglycemia is very common. And there's lots, there's increased hepatic gluconeogenesis and, and insulin resistance in skeletal muscle. And so we actually use a lot of insulin and we use insulin drips quite a bit. It acts to help prevent muscle protein breakdown and maintain lean body mass. So it's a, another form of, of um, muscle sparing uh, agents. And it depends on your serum glucose levels. That, we have actually looked at the effects of insulin on our burned children and we actually had a reduction in infection rates in our children who were on insulin drips compared to those who were not. So it's very, it's very tantalizing data. And of course you can't go around the block nowadays without reading about beta blockers. Dr. Herndon has been talking about beta blockers forever. They decrease heart rate and they ameliorate the catabolic state that's associated with sepsis. Now the problem with propranolol is number one, it's a nonspecific beta agonist. So if someone with underlying pulmonary dysfunction, it can be problematic. Number two, in infants, cardiac output is rate dependent. If you slow that rate, they cannot compensate. So it's potentially very dangerous to use in very small infants. Um, and the other thing is that it blocks the response to hypoglycemia. And so people can become profoundly hypoglycemic without showing the, the response. Most people break out into a cold sweat when they get hypoglycemic, they get jittery. That gets blocked if you're taking a beta blocker. So those things all have to be thought about. So what do we learn from metabolism? Faster is not always better. As we get older, that sounds really good. Um, you do need adequate nutrition to heal. And sometimes you need a little help from a drug. There are multi-center trials going on to optimize nut uh, nutrition in the metabolic state. Long-term outcomes, life is about living. It's not about doing the procedure. Integrating aesthetics into early burn excision is something we try and do every day. Think about it. If you're the person getting the graft, do you want the leftover piece, that little side piece that, you know, or do you want your surgeon to put the best thing in the best place at the best time? Of course you want that. So taking extra time to make sure that your first grafting is aesthetic as well as functional is really important, as well as survival. You can, I, I would argue you can pull those three things together in most people. 
So some of the basic tenets is that we prioritize our graphs to the visible and functional areas first. Hands, very high priority, because you can't do anything without your hands, right? And it's also, think about it, it's the only part of you that you see, unless you're one of those mirror stalkers, okay? You are looking at your hands every day doing things, and a lot of your self-image actually comes from looking at your hands. So you want people to have good-looking hands so that they, can, they, they view the rest of themselves that their hands look normal, that gets translated upwards. When you use a mesh, you use the smallest you can because mesh is fish skin. People call it fish skin. And a six-inch dermatome and avoid the graft junctions. The first excision in grafting, and those who have been in with us, especially last month, that first one really counts. And you notice we take big operations, that first one. You move as much eschar as the patient will tolerate, uh, you know, we'll 60, 70 percent of the body save the best skin for the functional areas, the thickest and the largest. Yes, this is our hand ring, and nobody ever complains about this. It's a testament to the painfulness of the donor site. Our priorities in this list: hands first, arms, feet, legs, trunk, the butt. It's there. You can hide it in a pair of shorts, right? Okay, hands are the daily activity, living things you need. And early excision actually makes the operation easier. You ever try and cut jello with a razor blade? With a razor? It doesn't work. Okay? You can cut meat with a razor, but you can't cut jello. When a burn eschar is old, it gets soft and gelatin like. And it's very hard to excise the non viable tissue. If you excise it while the eschar is still intact, you get a much cleaner cut and, and avoids errors. This is a hand that waited, th this, is th this is three months without a grafting on a hand. I can no longer make that hand completely functional. The best I can do is make it so he can have his beer, okay? And waiting does have a downside. We use this hand ring. It's nice because then no one else has to hold it. We have little rings from the ceiling. Um, and also it decreases venous return. When you put your hand down after you've excised, it will bleed a lot from the venous return. We dress it while it's elevated, and you guys have all seen the tumescence for the skin harvest, the 20 thousandths of an inch skin graft, and these are the hands, okay? Way different from that other hand that I, that I showed you. But doing this right the first time. And what after the graft is the therapy, and we have like some of the best therapists. Ingrid uh, Perry depicted here is just a gem. And yes, we do use uh, technology, video game technology, because have you ever seen a kid who get lost in a video game? They forget like the world. The, a bomb could go off next to them and they wouldn't know it. So we thought we'd try using that in therapy. Now this little guy, We'll see if we can make this work. Okay, this little guy, we couldn't get to move worth anything. So Ingrid said, I, you know, I, th I think I can get this kid to move if I find the right video game. And, you know, he started, like, moving, and he's, like, kind of having a good time. And um, I think it worked, don't you? <laughs> Wouldn't we all like to smash a tomato? Um, <laughs> So we thought, wait, why don't we just like study this? So we went through and we bought like a zillion PlayStations and Nintendo and we had all these video games. Everyone thought I was just gaming all day. Um, and we actually you did, studied which one worked the best, the iToy or the Wii or what. And look at the difference in range of motion that you can get. The improvement in range of motion from using a video game that they couldn't get with therapy alone. And we, this is this is work that's being been expanded and fancified, you know, by virtual reality. But this is something you can get on a computer game. And so there's a whole there's a whole research branch in therapy investigating the utility of video games on improving patient motion and patient life. So what have we learned for long term outcomes? We got to take our heads out of the sand because recovery is more than just those physical effects. And we have we have to involve patients in the process and Every, you have to work with everybody. The idea for a video game sure as heck didn't come from me, who can hardly turn on her computer, okay? It came from our therapist, who's working with the kids and had the ideas to, to go forth. And we've made a lot of progress in all these areas. And the next advances are going to be together. 
And as a result, we actually internationally have begun um, to create burn international guidelines, and I've been elected to to pull together the second set of burn international guidelines. So it, it is something that we can have guidelines for care, not just here in the United States, but worldwide, and achieve a standard that is higher than what we have currently. The future will come from partnerships with other societies, other professions, and others we can only imagine, but we can succeed with a little bit of work together. Thank you. As usual, Dr. Palmieri, outstanding, and it is a little daunting to uh, think of everybody running around with those gigantic cell phones and uh, quarters for pay phones, which I don't think even exist anymore. Yeah, not very many. It really made home call a different experience if you had to be close enough to be able to get to, to your phone. Um, pay phone. We have some time for questions. Tina, this is a quickie. Uh, I may have missed it, but uh, are the effects of growth hormone and the steroid analog uh, uh, additive, or do you use both, or uh, is it just steroids, or what? Yeah, you either use the growth hormone or the oxandrolone. We don't use them to, in, together. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit, it's too much for them. Okay. They can be used with propranolol. Okay. In fact, I was wondering about the potential use, and I just don't know, in other um, ICU sepsis states, has it moved out of the burn world into other ICU environments? Um, uh, growth hormone failed in other environments, and largely because they were given growth hormone without nutrition. And if you give growth hormone, then there's no substrate, you're going to hurt somebody, which is what happened. Um, oxandrolone, unfortunately, has not. I think it has potential to um, really expand into other environments. As the, it's used some in COPD patients and some in AIDS uh, wasting, um, but not as much as it could be used. And I suspect it will eventually move on onwards. Well, thank you very much. Really. Thank you.